Okay, team, we gotta take a gentle on our opponents today. It's true they may not be much in the way of competition, but after all, they are your parents. <laughs> Play ball! We've got quite a mix of players. Different countries, different races, different beliefs. So this team isn't just learning to play ball. We're learning to understand each other, understand our differences. And that means understanding world religions. Sitara and her dad, Farhad, are Muslim. That means they follow the religion of Islam. Today, there are more than one billion Muslims living all over the world. That's about one-sixth of the world's population. To understand Islam, the first thing we should know is what that name means. Islam is the Arabic word, meaning surrender. Muslims believe that they must surrender to Allah, the only God, and live the way God intends. Muslims believe that God's message was revealed to a prophet, or messenger of God, named Muhammad. The story of Muhammad and Islam begins in the deserts of Arabia, but today the story continues far beyond those desert sands. According to Islamic tradition, Muhammad was born in the year 570. He lived in the city of Mecca in what is now Saudi Arabia. Muhammad became a rich and successful merchant. He was also a spiritual man who often went up into a cave in the mountains outside Mecca to meditate. It was there, Muslims believe, when Muhammad was 40 years old that he had a vision that changed the world. The angel Gabriel appeared and commanded Muhammad to recite the words of God to the people. In those days, people of Mecca and throughout Arabia believed in many gods. Muhammad proclaimed there is only one true God, Allah, Allah is Arabic for the God. He preached monotheism, the belief in one God, to a city founded on polytheism, the belief in many gods. The new message made people angry. Muhammad pushed them further, calling on them to change their ways, give up fighting among themselves, and care for the poor. Finally, the people of Mecca forced Muhammad and his few followers to leave the city. In 622, they moved north to the city of Medina. People there had heard of Muhammad's message and they asked him to become their leader. The journey to Medina is known as the Hijra. It was a turning point in the history of Islam and so the year 622 is the year one in the Muslim calendar. It was in Medina that the first Muslims built their first house of worship called a mosque or masjid. Throughout his life, Muhammad continued to recite the words he and his followers believed came from God. Known as the Prophet, Muhammad was also a ruler and a warrior fighting to defend the new faith against its enemies. Eight years after his followers were forced out of Mecca, they returned in triumph. Mecca accepted the message of Muhammad and became the center of the Muslim world. Muhammad died two years later in 632 and was buried near the world's first masjid in Medina. Did you notice we never saw any pictures of Muhammad? Or at least none showing his face? Here's why. Muhammad insisted he was not holy. He was not supposed to be worshipped. He was only a messenger. So during his life and in the years after his death, no one ever made a painting or statue of Muhammad that might somehow be mistaken as an idol to worship. Among Muslims in the Arab world, that practice continues to this day. But Muhammad's message didn't remain among just the Arabs. In the hundred years following Muhammad's death, Islam spread to North Africa and Central Asia, India and Spain, as did knowledge. Muslims made many contributions to the advancement of civilization. By the 10th and 11th centuries, at a time when very few Europeans could read and write, many Muslims could. Muslim scholars translated texts written in other languages into Arabic, and they wrote new important books on sciences, like astronomy and medicine. Muslims opened the first hospitals. They also developed a system of mathematics called algebra, and their work influenced the rest of the world. Okay, now we've got some idea of Islam's past, but what does it mean to live as a Muslim? How do Muslims put the preaching of Muhammad into practice? 
Samir, Dina, Sami, and Naji talk about the basic principles of Islam while preparing a meal for the homeless. The way we practice Islam is through the five pillars. Think about it this way. Just as pillars support a building, Islam is supported by five important duties commanded by God called the five pillars. The first pillar is the Shahada. Yes. The testimony of faith. We say the words of the Shahada many times throughout the day, especially during our five daily prayers. The words of the Shahada mean that we believe in no God except Allah in the Arabic language and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was his messenger. Muslims will always say peace be upon him out of respect whenever they mention any prophet or messenger. The second pillar is Salah. It's the daily prayer. Yeah. We say prayers five times every day. At dawn, at midday, mid-afternoon, after sunset, and once again in the evening. And now we've reached pillar number three. Zakat is the money that Muslims must pay to the poor. It can be used to feed the hungry or take care of people in need. It's a very important part of Muslims' life to care for the needy and the poor. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, teaches us that we're not really good Muslims until we love for others all that we love for ourselves. Pillar number four is Saum. It's a time when we go without eating or drinking from dawn until sunset. We do this every year during the holy month of Ramadan. It helps us control our appetite and also our anger and what we say. It teaches us not to be selfish. It teaches us to be grateful for what we have. Well said. You know your pillars well. The last pillar is... Hajj. Yes, Hajj is the pilgrimage, the trip that every Muslim must make to the city of Mecca at least once in his or her lifetime. And it's a wonderful experience because Muslims get to know how they're all equal before God, regardless of our different colors, different languages, and different nationalities. Dr. Farooq Khan and his wife, Dr. Arfa Khan, have made the pilgrimage. Uh, Mecca for a Muslim is the focal central point of our faith. The most holiest place for the Muslims. We face Mecca when we pray, whether we are in the United States or in Indonesia, everybody is facing towards Mecca. Every Muslim is expected, if they can afford it physically and financially, to go there once in their lifetime for the pilgrimage of Hajj. And when I was in Mecca and the first time I saw the Kaaba, it was unbelievable and I felt the presence of God right there. There is a black stone in the wall of the Kaaba. It is said that this stone fell to earth from heaven as a sign of God's promise to his people. As we circle the Kaaba, every pilgrim tries to kiss or touch the black stone. You basically kind of come face to face in a place where the prophets have walked where history has been made, where civilizations have come from. It's overwhelming and it's uh, something that you remember for the rest of your life. The two million people, they all dress the same. To show that everyone, rich or poor, is equal in the eyes of God. All the men wear about the same kind of dress. They have two pieces of unsewn cloth. There is no difference of color, social background, your stature in society. You could be standing next to a king or a beggar. It makes no difference. All you think about is God and brings you very close to God. Making the Hajj to Mecca may happen only once in a lifetime, but every day, every Muslim practices the ritual of Salah, the daily prayers. Prayer is important in the life of a Muslim. A Muslim performs the ritual prayers five times each day no matter where he or she happens to be. On Fridays, Muslims gather to say midday prayers as a community at a mosque or masjid. For Muslims, attending a prayer service at a mosque is an important part of worship. My name is Ghazi Khan Khan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah. Before we go inside a mosque, we should, number one, take off our shoes. Most uh, mosques also have uh, an area for washing to show respect for the house of God. This wash is called 
الوضوء it is the ritual or the special way to do uh, washing and then you're ready now to face God Almighty in the service of the prayer boys and men pray in one section of the mosque and uh, women and girls pray in another section you will notice that uh, people wear loose clothing my name is Saya Kwaja and this is called a hijab and most people wear it to cover their hair in front of men in front of strangers you will see also men wearing different types of hats depending on the cultural habits of the area where that particular Muslim came from. It's called Taqiyya. Anyone who leads the prayer itself is called Al-Imam, meaning the first in the rows. And in each mosque you will see a niche on a wall that is the direction of Mecca. Al-Mihrab is the niche. You notice there are no pews, no uh, reserved chairs for anybody. Whoever comes first goes the first row. As you notice when we do our prayers, we have to bow to the majesty of God and then we have to prostrate to the majesty of God. And so by prostrating, we put our forehead, nose on the floor. And uh, this is my prayer beads. So every time I move one, I mention one of the 99 attributes of God. The merciful, the compassionate, 99 such names. But there's nothing holy about a prayer bead. It's just it's something to count with. You notice in our mosque has no statues, no pictures of any human life. See, in Islam, God is the creator, the power. And so to have a picture of a prophet, even a prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because we don't worship pictures, we worship the spirit of God, the creation itself. No statues, no paintings, but Muslims have another way to make their places of worship more beautiful. Look at these walls. These aren't just decorations, they're words. Words of the Quran, the holy book of Islam, are written in Arabic. Arabic is the language they believe was spoken by God to Muhammad. Many say to translate the Quran is to change the words of God. So Muslims throughout the world are urged to learn the words of their holy book in Arabic. Khadija Bayas and her dad Hamza not only learned the words of the Quran, but live by them. We believe the words in the Quran are the words God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. He passed these words on to his followers and they were written down for us to read and remember. Muslims read the Quran to learn how to live in a way that pleases God. Even before we learn to read, we learn to recite from the Quran. The Quran instructs us in just about every part of our life, how we treat our families, how we treat one another, even the food we eat. Muslims can eat most food, but we're not allowed to eat pork or to drink alcohol. The Quran isn't just a book of rules, it's a book of beautiful verses. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Master of the Day of Requital. It sounds even better in its true language, Arabic. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim Bismillahi rahman ar-rahim Alhamdulillahi rahbil alameen The words sound like poetry. Some people call it the language of heaven. Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of God, but it's not the only important sacred writing in their lives. The Hadith contains stories that were collected by Muhammad's followers about the things he said and did. Muslims use the Hadith as a guide for living in a way that is pleasing to God. 
Important Islamic writings like the Quran and Hadith provide the basis for a collection of religious laws and duties called Sharia. Sharia provides Muslims with guidelines for daily life. And it also shapes their beliefs about some of life's greatest questions. Many Muslims believe that if they live the way God intends, they will have a peaceful life. Muslims are taught that this life is a test and their actions determine their afterlife. When they die, they are judged according to how they live their lives. Muslims who have led a good life believe they will be rewarded in paradise, which the Quran describes as a green garden filled with trees and flowers. The Quran teaches that wicked people will face eternal punishment after they die. But Muslims also believe that God will be forgiving as long as people ask for forgiveness. But not all Muslims believe the exact same things or practice Islam in the same way. About 30 years after Muhammad died, Islam split into two different groups or sects. The majority of Muslims are Sunnis. About 10% of Muslims are part of the Shia or Shiite community. Many Shiites live in Iran and Iraq. The reason for the split is rooted in the differences of opinions about who should be Muhammad's successor, how Sharia is interpreted, and by whom. Islam is about life's joys, as well as its mysteries. And some of the most joyous Muslim traditions are celebrated to welcome their children into the world. Obeid and Yagut Khan share a special tradition with their family and friends. We want to thank everybody for coming to celebrate the uh, birth and baby naming of our son. We're very proud to have him with us and have you here with us to celebrate. His name is Zain Maji Khan. It's always important to kind of pass on from generation to generation what your culture is, what your background is. You know, talk about the values that of your religion or of your background that, that you hold dear and, and are good. Hey, little man. Huh? He's had a rough day already. He's dreaming. The custom is anywhere from 7 to 40 days after the baby's born. You have a ceremony called Akika. In that ceremony, you are supposed to um, announce to the world what the baby's name is, and you're supposed to shave the baby's head. You take the hair, you weigh it, and then you give the weight of that in gold or silver to the needy, or um, the community at large. Oh, who's this? Do you know who this is? That's the doctor who delivered your little brother. We named the baby Zane. It means beautiful. Um, that was the great-grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. The tradition is when the, when the baby's born, the first words that the baby's supposed to hear are God's name. After he was born, Obi put him on my chest, and um, I whispered the name of Allah in his right ear. The reason for that is, uh, by tradition, it's required that the first word the baby hears is the name of Allah. And then uh, she handed him back to me, and I whispered Suri Fatah in his other ear, which is the first chapter of the Holy Quran. It's a great feeling, you know, it's nice to have your family with you. You bring home this child, you can celebrate, you know, your joy. It's very nice. At the same time, you can teach your children the tradition, um, their religion. You can tell them what it's like. We've been doing this for generations and the importance of it. It's great to have something to celebrate. Most religions celebrate holidays every year. Some of those holidays are times for joyous celebrating. Some are times for serious reflection. And many times, the holiday is a time for both. For Muslims like Hamid and his family, Ramadan is the holiest time of year, and the festival that comes at its close is one of the happiest. Ramadan begins on a different day each year at the start of the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, when the moon is just a tiny sliver in the sky. Muslims believe God revealed his message to Muhammad, peace be upon him, for the first time during the month of Ramadan. For a whole month, we fast from sunrise to sunset, no eating or drinking all day. This fasting is called Som, the fourth of the five pillars. 
We start each day with a big meal, but no more eating once the sun comes up. Not even a drink of water or a stick of gum. Um, Fasting is hard for younger kids, so we usually don't fast a whole day or all month until we're 13. Do you think you know now what it's like to really be hungry and without food? Yeah. And that's the idea, to turn your back on usual everyday things and think hard about God and about whether we're living our lives the right way. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The days of Ramadan are a time for thinking and for praying. Evenings are a time for being together with your family. At the end of each day, we share a meal after the sun goes down. At the end of the month, when the moon is just a tiny sliver again, we share the celebration of the festival we call Eid al-Fitr. Eid al-Fitr is one of the happiest times of the year. After we go to prayers at the masjid, we come home to eat. It's the first time in a month we've eaten a meal during the day, and we make sure this meal is a good one. There's so much to eat, and it's all delicious, like rice, chicken, tabbouleh, eggplant. We have yogurt, olives, and a chickpea dish called hummus, and pita bread. For dessert, we love to eat things like batlawa and burma, and a date nut cookie called mamul. Eid al-Fitr goes on for three days. Most Muslims close up their businesses for the celebration. People give presents, and they travel to visit their families. The month of fasting helps us enjoy the days of feasting. Well, the kids are winning, as usual, and the parents seem to like it that way. You know, it's an interesting thing about a baseball team. Different players playing different positions make a team stronger. We can learn to understand those differences and learn to work with them.